David Ian Howe, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup. Yeah. You are an archaeologist based in Georgia, United States, and you are a co-host of the popular A Life in Ruins archaeology podcast. And your specialty is ethnocynology, which is the study of wolves and dogs in human cultural context. But before we start, can you just talk about how you got into this uh, pretty amazing subject? Yeah. Um Always liked archaeology as a kid. Uh, I loved History Channel, Discovery Channel, all those kind of things. I'd just get sucked into it on TV. So when I got to school, I uh, majored in history at first. And after I took some history classes, I loved. But then I realized there was also anthropology because I took that as an elective. And that mm. did with uh, you know, human prehistory, human evolution, and cultures, and primates, and things like that. And I was just sucked in. So I took that. Ended up uh, transferring schools to go to a better archaeology program or anthropology program. Fell in love with archaeology. Uh, ended up going to grad school, and yeah, uh, got my certifications as a professional archaeologist. So my master's uh, that was in the University of Wyoming out west in the states here. And uh, in both college and grad school, I was always really interested in the evolution of humans and dogs as a species. Uh, or, you know, separate species, but then the domestication of dogs. So I started just learning about it, and I realized that you could do that with all kinds of anthropology, and there's stuff all over the world about it, and I just started writing about it. And um, ethnosynology is a coin or a term coined by uh, Brian Cummins. He's a, an author, um, and he's an anthropologist as well. And ethno meaning people, synology meaning the study of dogs. So it's the basically dogs in human cultural contexts, and I think it's a really fascinating subject, and I ended up writing about it. I pitched um, well, several papers about it, and I pitched an idea to Ted Ed about, you know, the history of dogs and the story of it, and they ended up writing, right. or helping. I wrote it, they produced it, uh, it's on their YouTube channel now. Um, yeah, and here we are, now i got the Instagram, and it's going. Yeah, and the Instagram is doing well, you passed the, the 10k mark, I noticed, it's amazing. Yeah. So, uh, fake internet points, but I did something, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, before we get into the evolution of canids, that is, the members of the biological family that includes wolves, foxes, jackals, and dogs, let's just concentrate for a while on the most familiar of all canids, the domesticated dog. Now, some people look at all the varieties of dogs, from chihuahuas to Great Danes, and decide that this is an evolution, but simply selective breeding. But uh, it basically is evolution, isn't it? Um, there are people that argue that it's not because it has human intervention. Uh, and then there's people that argue that it does. And I, I fall into the, the middle, and I also lean mostly towards it is evolution. In the sense that humans play a role in it. However, the, the same mechanisms in which mutation occur and our you know, genetic drift occurs down to species... It's just human selection for and domestication is just sped up evolution in a controlled setting. So in that in that case, I would say that controlled breeding is evolution. It's just controlled or forced in a way. I guess you could say. Yeah, yeah, you could say uh, definitely in, in, in that regard. But if the way I explain it to you know my employees and to students is that if you were to let people and or just dogs and other animals exist on their own without, you know, modern intervention and things like that, they're going to genetically drift, they're going to modify, they're going to mutate, and they're going to change species. Speciation occurs like it does. It's just that wolves and dogs being bred down to be dogs what they are now is that same process. You're just taking it for millions of years, and you're doing it in the span of a couple thousand. Uh, and, that, and therefore, you can get a wolf turned into a chihuahua still the same animal and a chihuahua is not going to be a, its own natural occurrence but dogs as a result of wolves might also be a natural occurrence so that's uh so it's artificial I, selection not natural selection would you say um in the sense of dogs today and uh, like mm. established dog breeds definitely artificial yeah. um yeah. but in the proto times or the prehistoric times when dogs were just becoming a thing it may have been mostly natural Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I think everyone knows that dogs were domesticated from wolves thousands of years ago, whatever it was. I think it was 40,000 odd years ago. Um, is it about 40,000, Dave? Um, I, I would say upwards of that way. The, the first definitive evidence we have is about 33. 
and people still argue that, but we can definitely say by the Gravettian around 20,000 years ago, dogs exist. Right. Yeah. yeah, and we spoke about that uh, in detail, actually, in our Talk Beliefs interview on my other channel. Yeah. But um, what about wolves? What did they evolve from? Yeah, uh, wolves and dogs, by extent, are uh, members of the canid family in Canidae. And Canidae includes foxes, wolves, coyotes, jackals, all those kinds of things. Um, and Canidae is a, its own branch of Caniformia. And Caniformia are the dog-like carnivores, and dog as in look like wolves and dogs and have uh, the long snouts in which they do and non-retractable claws is how caniformia is classified. So in caniformia, you have the ursids, the ursidae, which is bears, uh, mustelids, uh, which are weasels and things like that. Um, and then also by extent, you have seals um, and uh, pinnipeds, which are, you know, seals, walruses and things like that. So though, a long time ago, those things, a lot of the common ancestors that now split off, but wolves themselves and the way we know them are canids in Canidae, and they evolved in North America along with the rest of the canids. Um, and a while back, they kind of migrated across into Asia, across the land bridge, and that's how there's foxes and jackals and wolves in, in the old world. Uh, and wolves as we know them kind of grew and evolved over that way in the steppes of uh, Asia and migrated back over towards the Americas and have you know, the gray wolves that we have here and coyotes and things like that. But another interesting fact is that, as I said earlier, that most of the canids' evolutionary history takes place in the Americas. You'll notice that in South America, specifically, you have all these really interesting and diverse canids, like the maned wolf or the bear dog, and things like that, um, or the raccoon dog. Bear dog's extinct. <laughs> uh, yeah. Raccoon dog. And there's uh, the other little guys down there, too, that are just interesting. And it, it, They're all in South America. Whereas the rest of the dogs around the world are a little more mainlined, mainstream. That's mm -hmm. a direct word. Yeah. But that was just kind of the overview. Uh, but if you want to get a little more detail about the, the ancient history of canids, uh, the first definitive canid that, or when I say definitive, I'm speaking in absolute, I guess like a Sith. But you, uh, the, the earliest thing that we can kind of call a canid as we know it today is Hesper Sion. And that lived uh, in the Eocene a long time ago uh, in the in the North America, um, and that evolved off into its own thing with the Osbornodons, uh, uh, and those you know are now extinct. Uh, Hesper Sion over time evolved into and descended into the Archaeocyon, which is a more it's a still a, a primitive dog like we know today, but it uh, or primitive canid I should say, uh, and that branched off into the uh, Episcyon and the Borophagines, and those. The bone-crushing dogs uh, are mm -hmm. extinct now, but th those were their own type of uh, species that lived a long time ago. And those went extinct and off of that line, so that, that line went off and went extinct, but off of the Arceus line, another line continued, and that turned into mm -hmm. the Leptocyon, and that was uh, about the mid-Miocene. Uh, the Leptocyon in the Miocene evolved into the modern canids we know today in the Pliocene and the Pleistocene which are, you know, right. foxes, wolves, can uh, jackals, things like that. Okay, let's talk about the different kinds of canids that have evolved and that are currently extant in the world. What species exist that perhaps not many people have heard of? Like I said, in, in South America, uh, we have this really diverse set of interesting canids. It's like a Jurassic Park of canids down there uh, of, that are very interesting and non-wolf-like. Uh, and we have the main mm -hmm. wolf, which, despite its name, Kind of looks like a fox, uh, and it kind of looks yeah. like a deer at the same time. Uh, those kind of Weird. they look kind of creepy, yeah. But they um, they live down there. They hunt rodents and they eat a lot of fruit, actually, too. Uh, and they live in uh, Brazil and or southern Brazil. What's the other area over there? Um, Uruguay and the, you know, in that kind of concentrated uh, south of the Amazon area between the Andes. And they live there uh, and. That's a, a one that people might not know about. There's also uh, the raccoon dog, which just kind of looks like a raccoon dog. Uh, that lives um, as well uh, today. Uh, you have the fennec foxes, which are you know, related to foxes. There's the different kinds of, um, say, the bush dog also lives down there. Um, just interesting little dogs that have their own tiny little niches in that specific part of the world. Um, yeah. And obviously they evolved in their own unique ways due to in the usual factors like environment 
And yeah, exactly. Like in yeah. different environmental circumstances led them to be that way. Um, an interesting thing about the, the main wolf is that it, it you know, kind of lives in a, a more solitary life, whereas canids, as we know them, are extremely social animals, and th these ones kind of live in, in solitude. So it's the area and the environment which they lived in evolved them to, to behave differently, and that's why I think they're unique looking too. One of the most surprising things that people discover when they start looking into the study of canids is that hyenas may look like a type of wolf or wild dog, but aren't actually canids at all. Isn't that right? Uh, hyenas, yeah. They, hyenas, um, I talked about caniformia earlier, like the dog-like carnivores. Hmm. Hyenas, they're in their own family called hyenidae, but they belong to the, the more like larger family of filiformia, which are the cat-like carnivores. Um, and in there you have, uh, cats, hyenas, and I want to say the, the civets, those kind of things, uh, live in mm -hmm. there. Yeah. And they, um, are cat-like and hyenas are a top scavenger in Africa. And I believe they live kind of in the, the Middle East, Near East area too. Uh, and they kind of fill a niche like wolves do. They're like a, they, they look like wolves in a sense. They don't have retractable claws and they can turn sharply uh, when they're running. Uh, like dogs and wolves can, but they, they're not cats. And they also, I mean, sorry, they're not dogs. They, they mark their territory like cats do. Uh, they rub their scents on different things like that. And they constantly groom mm. themselves to just like cats. But they also hunt in packs like wolves do, and they scavenge like perhaps wolves do. So they're similar yeah. as well. Yeah, they're more scavengers than wolves are, but they're more hunters in a pack than cats are, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, I guess it all goes back to, you know, everything comes from a, a, a common origin. If you go that far. Yeah, common Well, your colleagues have cataloged hundreds of dog burials across the United States, especially in the Southeast. Now, we spoke in detail about that in our Talk Beliefs interview, but what's happened since then? Are there any uh, interesting discoveries lately? Yeah, um, in terms of dog burials in the States, uh, there's some that get found every year, just, you know, you run of the male dog burials um, from Aboriginal cultures, but there's, um, I guess, in the news, everyone saw the, the dog that was found in the permafrost, or, or the yeah. dog-like animal found in the permafrost in Siberia, uh, and researchers carbon dated, uh, took some isotopic sampling from its rib bone, and it turned out to be about 18,000 years old, uh, and the DNA test that they did on it um, are inconclusive as to if it's a dog or a wolf. It doesn't say, it can't mm. determine for sure. So to me, and I haven't read the full study, nor do I think it's out yet um, in like a peer-reviewed journal. I, I could be wrong about that. But to my understanding of what the, the quotes from the researchers was, is that it seems to be one of those proto-dogs in that evolutionary period transition when they were becoming dogs from wolves. And if you look at the dog in the pictures, I'm sure, sure we'll be pulling up right here, you can, mm -hmm. can't really tell if it's a dog or a wolf because it's just a little puppy. You know, you, you can't tell. But um, I think one of the, the researchers said it looked like it had been placed there uh, in the ground, but I don't think that means it was buried. It just had kind of like what's mm -hmm. the ice man was just, you know, frozen in the permafrost and it had died. Um, but yeah, it's a, one of those in between dog and wolves or proto dogs, as I would call them, that are found. And we have tangible physical evidence of one now, too. As we already talked about, that dogs were domesticated from wolves thousands of years ago, over 30,000 years ago. But um, how do we think that this happened? And uh, how long ago did this all of this start? Yeah, uh, great question. I usually boil this down um, into four distinct theories. Um, and before I, I get into that, I, I can give a little bit of, I'll set the scene. Uh, so you have humans that, that leave Africa about, conservatively about 100,000 years ago. And humans have been, you know, modern humans for about, Homo sapiens have been around for about 200,000 years. Um, and then about 100,000 years ago, they, they explore into uh, the Near East and the Levant and then spread off into Asia and Europe. Um, and also before that, we're going down through India, down to, um, you know, uh, Southeast Asia and almost to Australia. Uh, and at, at that point, uh, humans are going into Europe and, and going further and further in. And remember, this is the Ice Age, so it's kind of a difficult environment to live in, especially for you know African foragers uh, at the time is what we're adapted to. Um, Neanderthals are living in Europe uh, about this time, uh, and the, I guess all the way up to Siberia and the Middle East at this point, too. Uh, so humans enter 
uh, Eurasia, and wolves are living there too. And they're and they're very adapted to this environment. They're one of the top predators. Uh, there's abundant megafauna that they can hunt together too, and and they're mostly eating the same fauna that we know that they eat today, like caribou and um, deer and elk and things like that. Uh, however, they're not used to this new species that comes in that also lives in a social group that's extremely good at hunting uh, and also hunts during the day and, you know, lives in the same sized kind of social family. So humans usually live in a band of about 30 to 50 people max and they might, all, like the villages and camps might be smaller than that, but they all have a collective inter-social group about that big. And wolves share a pack that's about one to three nuclear families, uh, which could be up to about, you know, 10 to 20 wolves at a time, too. So it's a similar uh, thing. And we're hunting the same kind of prey. We're going to be in interacting a lot. So this is where the four domestication theories come in. And the first domestication theory is the, see, the, the flight distance hypothesis. And this is proposed by Lorna and Raymond Coppinger. And they wrote a book called... Uh, Dogs, and they also wrote another book called uh, What is a Dog? And I think it's a like startling new understanding of canine origins of behavior. I'll uh, throw that up there. I'll send the pictures. They talk about flight distance. That's the first theory. And flight distance is, you know, the, the fight or flight instinct of canids, or any, mm -hmm. any animal for that matter. And the, these wolves probably noticed human camps had a lot of, you know, that, that old idea that you know, humans and people were so in tune with the environment, and they, they used all the stuff they could. Well, you can't really eat rib bones, and you can't really eat spines. So those were all thrown to the side of the camp, which still had meat smell on them, would have attracted scavengers and wolves. And wolves, being pretty smart themselves, would have been like, why do I need to hunt a whole deer if I can go, you know, to scavenge this primate camp? And they'd go do that, and they'd scavenge. And if humans saw them, or, you know, waved fire at them or shot at them, they'd run away. And the ones that acted aggressively and stayed and defended the carcass probably got killed by humans because they didn't want that around. The ones that knew how to run away would live another day and evolve to come back and they reproduce. Reproduce more wolves that are predisposed to being less, not less fearful of humans, but you know they, they not aggressive towards them and go away. This is natural selection. That's a form of natural selection, isn't it? <laughs> There you go, yeah. So this theory, I, I, I call the natural selection theory in my paper, and this is, uh, it's, it's wolves doing this with, by themselves and running away, and they're acting with their own agency and doing that. Over time, this invents, or this evolves into a protodog, which is then, you know, humans know they're not going to hurt them, or that this, this kind of wolf is not going to hurt them, and they don't have to kill it. And over time, they get, interact more, and the, the other theories take place. So that's one. The second theory is the symbiotic mutualism hypothesis, and this one is more of the artificial selection theory. Now, this right. part is kind of a similar thing as the first one in that, in that wolves were scavenging human camps, but also at the same time, humans and wolves were probably competing for the same kills, and as, because you don't just, back in the day, you didn't just shoot an animal and it died right on the spot like you do with like a rifle these days you you have to tra it bleeds you have to track it it could take hours to days um and then you run it down until it's exhausted and collapses and wolves do the same thing they're they're coursers and they're persistence hunters in which they just keep running and running they're not cheetah fast neither are we but the animal eventually collapse so humans probably clash with wolves at those kills and he wolves are already eating the kill Humans had to shoot them away with fire or whatnot. Those ones were probably directly killed. Or if the humans learned, okay, if I just throw this wolf a bone, it's not going to hurt me and it will go away. And that then causes human interaction with it, which is an artificial, or artificial you know, selection with wolves. And this is where humans exert pressure upon them. And over time, these wolves then descend and the ones that don't get killed and attack humans live another day to reproduce and create more offspring that are more predisposed to living with humans. Now, both these theories create what's called a, a niche construction, where a, an animal alters its behavior evolutionarily to adapt to a new environmental pressure. And there's nothing more environmentally pressuring than you know invasive humans that enter your environment. So they had to adapt to it. And so both those theories kind of are the 
natural and artificial selection theories where it just was kind of a thing that happened as humans entered. Now the other two theories, um, so the third I'll go into, is the um, Pinocchio hypothesis or the adopted pup theory or adopted wolf theory. And this is the idea that humans were just finding abandoned wolf pups, maybe they killed their mother, maybe the mother died, uh, and they put their hands into a den and pulled the puppies out when they were younger. Now, this just means that humans were intentionally taking wolves to domesticate them and to, and to raise them, either knowing that A, this could help me out and they could guard camp, they could do you know, all sorts of things, or B, they just wanted to play with a pet. Um, there was some option that they were doing where they figured there was some, there was some goal they were working towards, I'm assuming. And they would pull those out and raise them as puppies. And that's why it's called the Pinocchio hypothesis, because you're trying to make it into a real boy or a real dog. The, the problem with this theory is that a, a wild wolf is, is a wild wolf. It's not just raising it and putting a collar on it doesn't make it a dog. And you and I would both not adopt a wolf and put it right into the house immediately. Um, and it would, yeah, kind of, it would be kind of tough. So that's, that's the hesitation with that theory. But in combination with the first two I talked about, you know, say give a thousand years or so where these wolves are more predisposed and less aggressive towards humans, then this could be happening. Or you, and you're capturing them and raising them there too. Um, and I think it's an interesting theory. And the fourth one would be the captive wolf hypothesis um, and the fur hypothesis, or fur trapping hypothesis. And this is, this is a newer one. Um, this is Germain Pri et al. I want to say 2015. Uh, she has found in Europe that there are a lot of wolf bones that have cut marks on them for how they were being butchered by humans in the, you know, late um, Paleolithic. And yeah, they, it looks like these cut marks, and as we study cut marks archaeologically, you can see if they were just, you know, whacking it and butchering it for no reason with no purpose, or they were doing it with purpose. And the way these cut marks reflect on the bones is indicative of trying to preserve the furs, as we, as we would do it today, or a taxidermist would or a trapper, um, and these wolf bones are found there that way, and she thinks that maybe we were penning wolves or kind of trapping them or tying them to trees and feeding them scraps and, you know, physically keeping them hostage in a way, um, and that way in the middle of winter when we needed to wear new clothes or amend our clothes and it was too cold to go out and hunt for, you know, weeks on end, you could just kill the wolf that was tied up to the tree nearby camp and then use its fur. It's also an emergency food source. Also, if you tie them up around camp, then nothing else is going to come invade your camp or scavenge because they're going to be too scared of the wolves that are there. The other animals don't know they're tied up. You know? So they, that, that could be a way too. And that could be in tandem with the you know, adopting wolf pups theory. Uh, and if it has never known you know, living with a pack of wolves that only knows humans, it might be a little more less inclined to bite you. Uh, and But... It's still a wild animal. So it could be a combination of all these theories. It could have happened on its own, like the first theory posits, or it could just be that maybe they just were intentionally grabbing them. But uh, genetics point to that this domestication process happened twice in the world, once in Europe and once in Asia, kind of around the same time. And we can tell that through genetic um, you know, ancestry of these uh, DNA studies that are done. Um, and once wolves were domesticated and dogs were an established technology among people in the upper paleolithic and they were meeting each other more and by the time of you know the ice age ending when we start settling down and trading a lot more it could have been that you know these dogs were being traded and they had a certain stock that was faster they had a certain stock that was you know stronger and then all this genetic admixture happens and we have the dogs we have today but genetically we can see that it happened twice and it happened sometime between 40 and 20,000 years ago Wow, so fascinating. Yeah. Okay, David, that was really fascinating and great to see you again. I will leave yeah. links to your ethnocynology website and Instagram in the description below. Sure. And if people want to get in touch with you to ask you questions and uh, relate some stories, would that be all right? Absolutely. Great stuff. Okay, David, thank you once again. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it.